Hello, hello, Nimrod. Hi, good morning, Amelia. Great to chat again. Yeah, so I have Nimrod Priel with, with me today um, again. Yeah, how are you? I'm good. It's been a while. It's yeah, been yeah, I know. Um, just as a reminder for, for those people that like haven't seen our previous interviews, um, yeah, tell us a few words about yourself, you know, about Cord, of course, but even before that, like, um, your PM career, because that will make it very relevant for what we're going to be talking about later. Sure. Well, actually, my uh, career starts even earlier than uh, my PMing in something that's very on point to what we're talking about. I actually started out as an engineer, and um, my uh, one of the first things I did was um, machine learning. I, I worked as an mm -hmm. NLP engineer back in 2007 in two startups. Uh, both of them failed, but we did, uh, you know, very early days just before the whole deep learning um, sort of burst into the scene. Uh, but I've definitely been following that whole sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, scientific advances in this area and following the whole field uh, for quite a while. When um, I worked at a company that was acquired by Facebook, that's when I became a PM. Uh, but also at Facebook, I managed a team that worked closely with the AI teams at Facebook called Core Data Science. And so um, I'm quite familiar with, with the whole field and been following it for a while. Yeah, well, that's kind of, I didn't know that you worked in ML even before, you know, before it was cool, like a long time ago, it must have changed so much and it must be super interesting for you to see like how it's developing so yeah that's what we are going to talk about today essentially all the new changes in AI chat GPT how product managers are using can use the advances and um, in AI and NML and what you know you think like with your background knowledge especially is going to happen in the nearest future Absolutely. Um, yeah, so let, let's crack on. Um, my first question, um, yeah, Cord, like tell us a little bit more about it. And yeah, if you're planning to implement any AI features in it at all. Sure. So look, um, Cord doesn't directly have to do uh, with AI. What Cord does is we add collaboration into other SaaS B2B products. So mm -hmm. uh, the kind of features that uh, many of the viewers will know from Figma or Notion or, or even think of Google Docs, uh, just the ability to work together, see who was on a page, are they here now, uh, comment, leave comments contextually, comments that point at a piece of text or the point in a picture or something like that. And um, other SaaS vendors integrate us, companies like Monday.com, companies like uh, uh, ThoughtSpot, um, all kinds of products from BI and um, finance and planning tools to marketing tools, dashboards, uh, uh, sorry, uh, whiteboards, uh, a lot of different design tools and so on. Um, so that's what we do. So we are actually empowering people uh, to collaborate together whenever they need, you know, feedback or help or approval or to pass on the baton to the next person in line and uh, mm -hmm. where it's more efficient and convenient to do it in context rather than uh, on Slack or email or stuff like that. Uh, so that's what we do. I came up with this when I was a PM at Facebook because we worked on the internal Facebook uh, ecosystem of, of tools. Facebook doesn't buy a lot of SaaS. It really mm -hmm. builds in-house a whole lot of its stack. And there were hundreds of tools when I left Facebook and all of them were kind of uh, disjointed, but they had this like connective tissue between them. And in some of them, there was commenting functionality that was added. And I saw how useful that taken together with notifications. So you could be in one tool and you'd get notifications from all the others. So you could have a, a notification telling you, oh, there's a dip in a marketing dashboard, go take a look. Uh, and the next notification will tell you, oh, there's your employee uh, wants approval for a PTO, go take a look at that. And so I saw all of the opportunity to kind of build the uh, collaboration, the workflow into the tools and how it's missing outside. Mm. Um, so we don't, you know, again, we're sort of a platform SDK. We don't uh, have direct use of AI uh, because the way people end up using Cord inside their products is, is up to them. But we did, you know, we're not uh, 
uh, completely oblivious to what's going on. And what we did do is we trialed with um, one partner and also internally uh, calling ChatGPT on the back end because you can, uh, you know, programmatically create messages in code, so you can create a sort of, uh, you know, co-pilot pilot mm -hmm. to take the term from GitHub or or like a, an extra AI member of your team uh, to answer questions, maybe about the platform or stuff like that, um, or as a sort of support chat mechanism. Some of our clients use this uh, to provide support chat in cases where you need more than intercom. You need something where there's really kind of a, a persistent uh, uh, kind of commenting that stays on the page, is pointing to something, working with the, the whole team, being able to see it, which is not how intercom works, unfortunately. So this is this is some of the stuff that we've um, you know kind of played, toyed around with. But I can't say we we found the killer app. And in fact, I think mm. you know the whole world of AI is still kind of in the stage where it's looking uh, for that killer app. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I was smiling because we are working on exactly the same solution for user pilots. So uh -huh. essentially, um, kind of a co-pilot for our users that is going to be trained on our help docs, on our uh, knowledge base and um, data about our product and is going to like provide them with answers on how to, you know, do something and be like the kind of standby customer um, service person. Well, there are, of course, limitations to, to that because, you know, it works off probability. So it sometimes still comes up with weird hallucinations. And that's kind of my observation. You were right to say that, well, we haven't found the killer app. And from what I've been reading about how product managers and the product community in general is using ChatGPT, I kind of have a hunch that people haven't cracked it yet. Um, I've read a lot of these posts that I had the impression were written for the sake of writing them, right? Like, um, how should you use um, ChatGPT as a product manager? Like, oh, use it to give you product ideas or <laughs> to give you market research when it's capped at 2021 and it doesn't, you know, think. So wh what is your take on this? Like, what do you think realistically can product people do with ChatGPT um, at this point? Yeah, so I, I think you're right. I thought a lot about it. And the framing that I really like is actually taken from someone called Avi Goldfarb. He's a, a professor of um, uh, management in uh, Toronto in Canada, but he wrote um, a, a few books uh, back when Google was starting out, he wrote a book about search and most recently he wrote a book about um, AI from a sort of uh, kind of meta economic perspective. And um, the book is called Prediction Machine. It's a great book. One of the points that he makes, it makes a, a few very interesting points. One is that when uh, you think of something like AI, it doesn't uh, create net new capabilities. These are things that theoretically humans could have done it's just that now we have a machine so uh, that can do them at scale and at low cost so even with the cost of chat gpt this is nothing compared to the cost of like asking a human uh for advice but essentially all these um algorithms are trying to do is stuff that you could theoretically have hired an artist an artist to uh generate the image for you or hired someone who's an expert at user pilots docs to mm -hmm. uh, kind of ask them the question, right? And so he says, from an economic perspective, when we have a good, like um, uh, uh, generating images that uh, drops in cost significantly, uh, what we should expect to happen is uh, increased demand in the complements of that good, right? So if the price of, of uh, uh, sugar uh, drops, then uh, there would be more demand theoretically for tea or, or coffee, or maybe mm -hmm. the, a better example is, is the opposite when the price for coffee drops. Uh, there's going to be less demand for its uh, alternatives. Um, and with AI, with uh, uh, sort of the cost of uh, making predictions going down, uh, what we should expect is a lot of demand for data. 
and the value is going to be in the data that drives these uh, machines and in the um, in the, these algorithms. The other point he makes is he says, you know, these things we can look at very very analogous cases. So he tells a story that I think is fascinating, worth for our viewers to hear, which is um, when uh, the spreadsheet was invented, the, the, the essentially what was before Excel back in the sixties and seventies, the concept of a uh, spreadsheet applications. Accountants all around the world were worried that their jobs are going to be taken by these spreadsheets and that they have nothing to do. Um, and he says that before then, accountants, their um, main kind of uh, task or, or or like main kind of stuff they did at work was to calculate, to just sum up uh, uh, numbers. And they would get exercises like uh, take the random, a random page from the phone book. Uh, you know, the, the professor would say, take page 387 out of the phone book and sum up all the numbers. And the professor had already done the calculation. He would check that the students knew how to do these like very, very complicated, you know, many seven digit calculations because there was no way to do it. And um, back then, because it was so slow and tedious, you needed about an accountant per 40 or 50 employees because just the amount of work that was generated mm -hmm. and the amount of tallying up that was needed to do um, was that, uh, uh, you know, significant. And what happened once a spreadsheet came around is the opposite of what people uh, uh, thought would happen. Instead of kind of reducing demand for accountants, it increased the value of accountants because what they did now is they uh, directed people how the, the actual calculations could be done by the computer, but they directed people how to like evade tax or, <laughs> you know, be more tax efficient. And they could suddenly take on many, many companies. And we um, saw the rise of what today's like accounting firms where, you know, you have an accountant that manages your case and manages 17 other companies uh, and they can do it efficient, efficiently. And now they, they make more money because they make a little bit out of each of the companies. Uh, and so it's actually um, been helpful to accounts. I think the same thing we could expect to happen in AI because fundamentally um, AI gives us the predictions, but people need to guide it. We need the taste making, the the art direction. You know, we need curation in this kind of world of abundance that the AI is going to create. Um, so even if the execution is computer aided, you know, just like instead of drawing stuff, we have renders. Um, now we'll have you know AI generated imagery, AI generated text. Somebody needs to decide what is actually. Um, you know, valuable, interesting, how to put it together, get the feedback from the real world. Um, I feel like, you know, it lends itself to stuff that's digital, but sometimes you still, we're still kind of human, physical human beings, and we're doing stuff in the real world. Um, and I think, you know, you could just compare the the AI itself, the algorithm itself with like Photoshop filters or a mix, remixing music, right? Um, it'll do that. Uh, but it'll enable a bigger scale of production um, where more stuff is more higher quality produced even by, you know, one person instead of like a, a whole Disney workshop of, of cell animators yeah. doing stuff manually. So that's my kind of take on, on where I think we'll find um, the killer apps evolving, if that makes sense, uh, broadly. And then we can talk about what it means for product. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. And I've been thinking a lot about how it's affecting content. And as you said, like the demand for people writing content itself will probably decrease because it will become so cheap and easy to generate content. But then the sort of ancillary services of the prompt engineers that are going to think, oh, what kind of data? Like, well, first, where do I get the data from? But what kind of data do I need to feed in there to produce the content? And then the content editor, who in turn are going to do the fact checks who are going to rewrite the you know things that don't make sense or remove the hallucination or add in more nuanced data and personal experience so suddenly their role becomes a lot more nuanced and important for the whole process so previously we kind of saw content editors as the necessary evil right and they weren't necessarily that well paid because you know, everyone who spoke decent English and could use Grammarly, right, and WordPress could be an editor. And now it's suddenly going to become a lot more responsible, right, especially in terms of fact checking and ensuring that we don't publish things that are, you know, scarily inaccurate. 
Um, and yeah, also in terms of like the whole structure and organization of the text. But yeah. um, back to my original question, I'm super curious how you are actually using um, chat GPT now in your work as PM as well, like as a CEO, of course, as well. Um, and how you think other PMs could be used and get more beyond these kind of like, yeah, weird use cases that don't really make sense. Yeah. So look, just like you um, say uh, about user pilot, we also integrated our docs now are mm -hmm. searchable and we use ChatGPT on the back end of that. Um, something a bit more useful and unique, I think, is uh, we're, add, we're thinking of adding the capability to search messages inside Cord. So if you're a client, let's say you're using, um, you know, uh, Monday.com's uh, product work canvas, which uh, includes Cord in it, and you had lots of discussions with your teammates, maybe you remember some sort of message, you want to find it, uh, and uh, we're going to add search uh, with ChatGPT to help with that. Um, but to be fair, this is not um, a unique, like a new novel capability. Search existed, and and sort of uh, kind of search APIs for um, your own database. You know, anything from Elasticsearch to Algolia existed for for uh, years. It's really that because it is prompt based, and because it is so data agnostic. Um, the API is very, very easy to integrate. It's just easy to integrate ChatGPT into stuff um, because it, the, the interface is kind of, it takes any text and it returns a text and it kind of trains on anything. You just show it um, and you don't have to like go through complex installations and databases and so on for uh, unique products. Uh, but that's, you know, so that's what we're doing right now. Uh, we have a few of our developers who actually said Copilot has helped them with code. Um, it's adopted by the teams, even by very senior engineers. So it's not about kind of, oh, it mm. helps kind of junior coders. No, in fact, it's like useful for anyone. But of course, there's error. There's a big error rate with you talk about with hallucination. And, you know, it probably cuts some time, um, but that's hardly the, the bottleneck. Uh, you know, when you create a product, all PMs know that the problem is not really how long it takes to do things. The problem is exactly the taste making. What is the right thing? And that's, I think, where the heart of kind of how I look our interface with AI is going to be over the next few years. Really, and we saw it in Facebook as well with people managing AI products. The, the question is, um, how do you choose the goal, right? The question is, mm -hmm. what do you tell the AI to to optimize for, what does it need to do? And I think that goes for content creation as well. Um, in the end of the day, sure, typing the actual content was a bit of the time of a content writer, but it's like you say, it's the research, it's the tone of voice. It's like, what are we even writing about? In the end of the day, the AI will mostly know to spit out stuff that was already there. Mm -hmm. We need to write about something that never existed. If core didn't exist, you couldn't ask the AI what is yeah. core. So somebody has to go in and kind of input that in the first place. Um, so I think, you know, there's some stuff to be said for product surfaces changing. I think uh, we're kind of, we've been training PMs and, and, and kind of thinking for 20 odd years in terms of UX and buttons and where to place the buttons and how to like, make the, the buttons and forms very, very clear. Whereas with um, ChatGPT, you kind of think of, well, we can do a lot more with text, right? It's like you know, moving us to a mm -hmm. world of like text-based adventures where um, instead of kind of having a button for every single affordance that your app can do, you can kind of have this menu that's, that's text-based um, and that's open-ended and that users can just find the right thing in the the right kind of transformation they need to do in the app. Um, so I think that's that's an interesting place. Uh, and it's a good, you know, good PM now just has more tools in their toolbox, right? Like I can solve this with a lot of buttons and forms and maybe I can solve this also with, um, with a chat-based uh, AI. Wow, um, this is an interesting use case. Like how, I haven't thought of it, like how on um, AI and chat-based tools are going to change UX but yeah you're right like especially with more complex products that are super cluttered right will we be able to bring the right screens and the right elements 
kind of dynamically into our dashboard when we need them and then switch them off when we don't. Like, I mean, it's already kind of being resolved with dashboards that you can create, like custom dashboards in certain more complex products or analytics tools where you kind of have the shortcuts to what you need because ultimately the overload of information that you, you get in these complex products um, is, is the problem. Um, yeah. that, dashboards that, is a great example because the yeah. amount of dimensions that you can cut down, like I want to see the sales from you know Ohio by store, uh, you know, in these dates and that and, and so on and so forth. It's like hard to generate the SQL for these. Uh, mm. It's hard to click, you know, 17 selectors for these. Um, and I think it's a it's a place, you know, there's already innovators in that space. ThoughtSpot, one of our clients, is basically a way to generate data uh, from free text search. We built something similar uh, at Facebook as well in my time. And th this is, again, sort of before AI. But... Mm. Um, it's kind of, I think the pattern that I see in all of these is that they save the technical execution piece of work, but somebody needs to still say, what is the data that I need to see now? How will it help me make a real decision in the real world? And there lies a lot of the challenge, a lot of the kind of um, human, creative, very broad context kind of thinking. I don't think that is Repli repl replicable today. I'm not sure it's replicable in general because it's very, very contextual and not very copy pasted. And in the end of the day, when you know how these machines are, are built, they are remixing a lot of existing inputs together probabilistically, smartly in a way that, that mimics uh, mm -hmm. humans. Um, but I'm not quite sure that it's still will be able to just kind of figure out it doesn't it doesn't live in the real world and has these real world inputs yet uh to be able to kind of say oh this is the right way for you mr pm to answer the question of what should be on your roadmap next right i don't mm -hmm. think that's uh coming anytime huh so that's kind of like probably the biggest um you know promise and sort of the most alluring scenario that ultimately because um AI will have access to so much data, so much more data that it could potentially have 300 years of PM experience in a specific industry, right? Rather than I don't know, three or 10, um, that it would be able to analyze data kind of a lot better, right? And bring up these decisions, maybe not decisions, but at least sort of results um, a lot faster and you know dynamically I'm like hoping for some kind of a dynamic segmentation of users because um, as you said one thing is actually selecting all the criteria that um, you should put in a segment but a lot of our users are user pilot don't even know what they should be selecting so that's the problem that they are overwhelmed by all the user data. They don't have time to, you know, spend, especially with smaller companies that don't have a data analyst to tell them, oh, you're actually having a trend here, right? Um, how basically their users are using their tool and falling into these different segments. So we're kind of trying to help with that. Um, and we also have this like chat query based, you know, search for for the analytics. But, you know, I don't have background in ML. I don't know how it's possible or impossible. So what's your take on this? You said it will still take a very long time to get there. I, I think it'll, um, it's outside of what um, I understand we can do today to imagine that the AI will self-direct on what's good, uh, what's the next right thing to do in your product. It'll, it'll give you an answer, um, but that's because what it's learned to do is speak to humans in a confident way. Maybe maybe that's really what PMs are <laughs> very good, uh, trained to be good at. But um, seriously, I think there are statistical techniques and AI can probably kind of uh, be utilized in doing the thing that you're talking about, which I think is very useful, which is essentially, again, sort of taking the the rote kind of work from a uh, an analyst that might have been tasked with 
take this trend, maybe we're, we're going down right now, we want to know where are we going down the most in a specific country, in a specific operating system, in a specific version of the of the app, in, a, you know, what's the, like, where is this, what's contributing the most to this trend and kind of give you the five top factors. That's a thing you can task the AI with. It's going to save a lot of time. It's going to do it more rigorously and accurately. That's really, really helpful. My view of it is there's someone behind that steering wheel and that's the PM's job. It's kind of like, you know, brands will be there, but what explains it? What is the real true um, factor uh, that drives this change? Um, what's the uh, kind of thing that you need to do next to, to solve it, right? Like, okay, so the trend is driven by, uh, I don't know, uh, drop in use in Japan. Okay, how do we research this? Um, you know, at Facebook, something else that you mentioned, I think it's really good at and it's going to be very, very helpful is, is summarizing user research. Uh, we had tools based on, again, sort of more um, basic techniques uh, in, 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 in AI than, than exists today, but still a, a very sophisticated tool at Facebook for clustering uh, user reviews. And we have used it in the past to understand, for example, our app um, wasn't uh, performing very well. We scraped all of the ratings from uh, the App Store and the Play Store, and we throw thrown it into the clustering tool because there were thousands of ratings. And we could see that the biggest cluster that we could address was battery issues, right? So we um, had a big project on battery issues, and we monitored it against how many of these one two star ratings are uh, talking about battery after the uh, releases where we fixed it. That's an approach assisted by AI research, uh, in my in my view. Uh, but I don't think you know. There's there's kind of like the AI product. Will AI change our product? And that's where I think it'll it'll be more around adding text, adding generative images into the product experience, and making products where you can do more high quality stuff with less people. Maybe you can create your own Disney animated of uh, 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 you know, picture out of your home by yourself with just your ideas and you don't need like, you know, 500 cell animators in a in a workshop. Um, and that's great. That's like the AI product itself. There's there's some PM kind of practice that you'll need, we'll all need to learn in how do you manage AI products, right? Like the practices of going over the bad cases, understanding how the data leads it to generate different things, quite a different um kind of a process or approach of PMing than we've had so far with very deterministic kind of mm -hmm. input output. This is the behavior, click the button, does this, right? Um, the second thing is like, will the PM practice itself, the, the processes that we have today, like writing user stories, doing user research, um, creating roadmaps, analyzing data, how will that change? There, I think, you know, with writing stories, sure, the AI can can write user stories for you. Do you, it kind of begs the question, do you even need them? Kind mm -hmm. of like content that is auto-generated, that is just re rehashing stuff and not actually highlighting new stuff. Like, do you actually need it? The reason I love the user pilot content is because there's a very smart, opinionated person behind it um, view that is writing on topics and it with with adding novel kind of insight and novel views. And I don't know if you know some of the phrasing or whatever you use AI to to help kind of the text flow and and jump over you know both of our like English as a second language barriers. That's that's fine. That doesn't change the the fundamental kind of. It's almost like again a Photoshop filter doesn't mm. mean that the person hasn't drawn it because they haven't kind of selected the the color value of every single pixel right um so i think in the actual practice of of pming ai will be an accelerator in some of these processes like querying data and summarizing user research uh but not kind of fundamentally changing the the pm's kind of most important fundamental contribution which is understanding mm -hmm deeply understanding and empathizing with users and finding the right, um, you know, kind of balance of all the needs um, for everyone and, and, and delivering a product on it.
hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, this analogy with, for instance, writing product brands, which are super opinionated. Um, I do use, I have recently been using um, ChatGPT, but for kind of very similar um, reasons that you mentioned. So to summarize, so instead of spending, you know, three hours on reading, you know, several articles that I wanted to read anyway, I'm going to ask it to summarize them for me. So of course I need to feed them piece by piece to summarize like longer chunks. And then I can, you know, read a lot more, a lot faster and maybe make these connections a lot faster, but I ultimately still need to make the connections. It, doesn't have a stance right it doesn't like have the history of, of being in the industry for a few years and kind of understanding the bigger picture um so yeah it's still uh, a helping resource but it's not replacing either me or anyone else uh, for that matter i think in in a significant way yeah um yeah, I think we, we touched upon a lot of the questions that I had here, right? Um, just kind of as a closing, you know, one, what what do you think is your, what is your favorite prompt currently? Like, what is your favorite personal, like, use of that GPT? Well, I, I have to, I, I don't think I have a favorite prompt. I I like following the, the whole kind of, um, paths or, or all the stories where people have found ways to kind of cause the AI to uh, behave like a, like a personality, like a single kind of identified human, that, that stuff that feels the most eerily kind of science fiction AI kind of stuff. I, I see it for what it is. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a bot. It's a sophisticated enough chat bot that it makes this kind of a, it it goes over some threshold of fooling us that uh, the earlier attempts, you know, from the seventies, we had all of these uh, mm. uh, computer psychologists and whatever, um, were a little too kind of uh, obvious for for our sophisticated minds and and helped us understand. So I, I have no uh, kind of personally, I stand on the ones that don't feel that this is anywhere near uh, consciousness or anything like that. And still, um, this is the most uh, I think kind of. Uh, uh, enjoyable or interesting uh, thing um, from a product, you know, from, from an actual perspective, I think generative imagery for marketing mm. is really interesting. We always had this thing in marketing where it just is nicer as humans to look at something visual appealing. Um, it makes us feel great. And there's, you know, and the way it was served um, you know, if you look at Superhuman, uh, the app and email, when you get to zero, uh, kind of inbox zero, it, it gives you a random photo, a lot of blogs and stuff, used um, stock photography, right? And a lot of these services that give you a lot of stock photography. Um, and so kind of, again, kind of, kind of being more, being able to create more with that, more different themes, more stuff that's on brand for you. If you read some newsletters like Axios, they have a, a great production team that makes these kind of very branded, um, very creative imagery that resonates with what the topic of the um, article is about. Maybe it's the picture of, of someone famous from VC. Maybe it's just the kind of pictures of money and bits and bytes and whatever. And I think that's, that. that's great. Yeah, that's like, yeah. it's cool if AI can help us kind of mash up these uh, pictures faster and, and uh, you know, we'll still look at them and see that they that they make sense and they don't look really, really awkward. And um, But that's that's a place where, I've, you know, I find it very useful. Uh, it just saves time and effort and you can focus the... Uh, brand designers and like higher priority stuff than churning out three images per newsletter every week right mm, that's a super interesting um direction because i haven't honestly that's like probably the thing i haven't tried at all right generating images because i always think oh you know this is all based on data this is all based on you know like b2b stuff is very boring so these are mostly like screenshots of um UI so I struggled to come up with ideas how I could use it and how we could you know implement it in the marketing side of user pilot 
Um, yeah, but although there are some use cases, for instance, passive link building, right, where you actually create the stock images um, on specific topics for journalists to take with a Creative Commons license and like getting you a link from a you know, big publication in advance, where I think this could totally um, be useful. Um, yeah. so. But yeah, still it cannot like dynamically generate or regenerate, for instance, you know, screenshots of our app, like for a particular use case with certain data, for instance, Photoshopped into it, right? Um, yeah. And when it could do it, it'll be amazing. It'll just save you time uh, kind of creating this. Yeah. Somebody will still have to say, well, what I want to talk about is good versus bad onboarding, say, or good yeah. versus bad collaboration. And now I need a screenshot of how it looks like when it's messy and a screenshot of how it looks like when it's good. And, and I know what that means for me, what I'm trying to highlight, what is messy, what is good, why is it good? You know, all of that is, I think, very deeply human uh, interactions in the real world. It's not that I don't think AI will ever, I don't think that, you know, it's not that there's like some secret magical sauce in a soul that makes this happen, but it's the fact that we're, actually experiencing what it is to be human and the AI doesn't. We're experiencing what is the limits of time, the lack of time and attention, being tired, being, you know, overly, the, the AI doesn't experience all of that. So we can actually say, well, users need a simpler flow. They need, mm. you know, clear goals. They need, it's, it comes from our user experience, that empathy, uh, our, our human experience, sorry. And I think uh, AI is a ways away from that, very, very long ways away from that, even if it can mimic some of our responses to stuff. Yeah, as you said, it's not opinionated. It can't have opinion because it doesn't have emotions. So, and you know, opinions typically come from our reaction, our response to a stimulus, right? So you're exposed to bad UX and it takes you super long to do something. Then you form an opinion about like a way of doing something or a startup. And there's a lot of this tacit knowledge that doesn't necessarily come from, you know, like the prefrontal cortex and your kind of knowledge about the world it comes from like the other parts of your brain which maybe are even more primal and then you pass them on right to integrate with your existing knowledge and produce an opinion and also produce a solution because ultimately what pms are doing what marketers as well are doing is providing the best experience for the user yes and to provide the best experience for the user. And this is a catchphrase, but I think it's very important actually in this heyday of AI, where you need empathy. So you need to be able to relate to the user on this like very human level, on the emotional level. And this is what obviously AI lacks. And I don't know how probability can solve that. I agree with you there. I think, you know, um, you could make the argument that if we took the AI and gave it all of the inputs that a person really, really receives throughout their lifetime and this deep understanding, then even with the tools of probability, we'd recreate a human. I agree, you know, maybe that's coming in 10 years time. The technology today that is like making it read the entire internet and look at every image in the world and then spit out variations of it is not what being human is. It's not the human experience that causes us to um, you know, value, time, simplicity, um, you know, a million other things that maybe I don't know how to put the name for, but but come from an actual human experience. Yeah, and, you know, come to think about it, even if we were to feed the data from, like, you know, have someone walk around with a camera and record all of their experiences and all the, like, objects and tools and products they interact with and feed that into a machine, if you have two people, right, that go through exactly the same path, they are still going to produce different experiences because they have different personalities and there is like, you know, the genetic component and everything else. So I think we don't quite understand enough, right, what creates human experience and why 
is it so fundamentally unique for every person so to be able to ultimately recreate it um so there is there is this um and that kind of often results like even when you come up with a good idea right or a bad idea or any idea you kind of like retrace your steps and know exactly what contributed to this idea right yeah and you also have to try it and that's the thing with these ai hallucinations um the ai can go and write a piece of text that says uh you know we should kill all humans or whatever <laughs> or we should kill all whatever there's something very I'm, I'm choosing something very aggressive and nasty because it is not embedded in the real world it behaves like you know like an 80 year old might say we should kill everyone but at some point you uh, interact enough with the world to have a realistic understanding of what's kind of what's going to drive what what's good or bad to have the again sort of using this word the empathy or the kind of um uh maybe Kantian understanding of like I am like other humans I share their experience there's implications to what I say what I do we don't have that the AI just spits text and we read it and like it doesn't really so so it can hallucinate a lot of stuff but it it won't be able to filter it because it's not really an agent in the world that that has feedback on all these things that can uh, learn and understand the the impacts and you know select by that um i think that's that's a lot of the stuff that's missing there and where we will still be in charge we will still be need to kind of make these decisions uh hopefully with with a lot of that positive empathy but uh, I'm, I'm kind of an optimistic person there so 100 percent. cool so we've um established that robots are not going to take our jobs anytime soon and um, pms yeah. are safe <laughs> yeah <laughs> pms are safe <laughs> that's um, a happy end i guess and a good conclusion um thank you so much for all the in insights in road i think that's super interesting we're probably going to cut it up a little bit um yeah, no worries. And yeah, um, just make sure that people can like also engage with these like bite size because I think some bits were really super interesting. Um, awesome, thank you. Thanks so much. This was delightful to speak about this. <laughs>